beaver. He had a beat up old Chevy truck. Her license plate red, I'm a dreamer. His bumper sticker said, kiss my butt. He met her one day when she was stranded.
around the South Island and um, I was sitting out with my guitar and I just came up with this little riff. And then the lyrics came, so this is my song, Down South. forest and they put on coats in the silvery moonlight and they started dancing around <laughs> in my dream. <laughs> Some of it was true, there were a lot of animals but the coats really didn't have that much. And it goes like this, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> one more time, because you're getting there, I'm not getting there. <laughs> one more time. Please lend me a hand, I'm tired and I'm lonely. Call out to the driver to try and catch his eye.
couple of uh, what I like to call old British ballads for you. guitars from the 1920s that were used a lot for Hawaiian uh, steel guitar playing. And this is a modern recreation. A couple years ago I brought uh, my old style to Weisenborn, which is probably like from the mid-1920s. And Jason Bowerman and I spent uh, the better part of a day measuring and photographing and talking about Weisenborn designs. And Jason was uh, really a, the big mover in, in getting this design um, to fruition. And um, when I first, when I got the first one, I got the prototype. Uh, Weizenmoors were normally made from koa, which is a dark, almost a mahogany kind of wood, a dark reddish color. Um, and when the first prototype that he, he brought, he didn't have enough koa that was big enough to make a Weizenmoor, because you see how long that back is. You need a really long piece of wood. The only wood he had was myrtle wood, and the, the, the one, the prototype was like bright white. It was almost like a like a Weizenmoor in reverse. And I was kind of heartbroken to see it. It just didn't, didn't look right. But I played the thing, and it was really fantastic. Um, and I really got to uh, really like the attributes of Myrtle Wood. A, a Weisenborn guitar has a huge amount of bass. For a guitar this skinny, it's got a huge amount of bass, and it really punches and projects really well. Um, but, and the koa has a very explosive sound. The, the Myrtle is not quite as immediate and explosive as the koa, but what you get is a beautiful, fat, uh, rich, sustainy kind of note, and uh, as you probably have noticed, I don't play a whole lot of notes, so I got to try to get the most out of every one. I don't, I don't squander them like some guys. <laughs> <laughs> when I grew up, we had two notes. <laughs> Both of them were A. <laughs> you can also turn it up louder than my other guitar, so it, uh, it kind of once you play a wise board, it kind of ruins the night for everything else. <laughs> You also play, the reason they call it steel guitar is because you play with one of these things, which is called a steel. Um, then uh, the National Guitar Company came along in the, in the 1920s and started making guitars out of steel, and they called those National Steel Guitars, and that sort of confused it.
Breedlove. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for the company. And um, I'll take you through a 20 minute uh, tour of our factory. First, I want to start off by telling you some of the things that are unique about our company uh, compared to many of the other guitar manufacturers. It's, I think it's kind of an important question why, what makes a Breedlove a Breedlove rather than many other companies' uh, products. We, um, are, we've been around for about 20 years. We started off in Tomalo, a little small workshop. Larry Breedlove and Steve Henderson uh, left Taylor Guitars and started this company. And Kim Breedlove, our master luthier, came and joined shortly after that to join the company. Um, right now, 20 years later, we've been in this building for two years and we sell about $10 million worth of guitars all around the world. Um, down small towns in South Africa, Taiwan, all over. We're, we're strong exporter for Ben for the United States and uh, we, uh, we sell thousands of guitars, we sell container loads worth of guitars. When you build a guitar and you choose the woods for it, you're going to see various flexibility in the woods. So this is a Sitka top, uh, which will be a top of an acoustic guitar. And if you go through the stack of joined Sitka, you're going to see that some boards are really flexible and some are extremely rigid where you can't move them. Guitar manufacturers have a, a set group of tolerances that they build guitars with because they need the strength to be able to put a bridge on here and tune up that guitar, tighten up the strings without the, the top blowing out of the guitar just coming undone. So the, the task is how can you make the, the most resonant, lively guitar with the lightest woods without having it be so weak that if you hit a chord it'll just explode the guitar. So we sought out to do that. One way we do it is we measure the strength of each of our woods and then determine how thinly we can shave it out it out. So if this top is very rigid, we can make it extremely thin and still have that, um, that resonance and that tone quality. <coughs> if it's very flexible, then, then we thin it out just a little bit. That means where if you go through another guitar manufacturer's line of guitars, you go through 10 guitars, you might find one or two that sound good, that sound magical, because the engineering and the tolerances that they're building for are mated perfectly to the flexibility and the strength of that wood. But with us, all of our guitars have that magic quality because our luthiers measure the strength of the wood and thin it out as much as they can. It's a human element that makes all of our guitars have that magic sound. And, and any guitarist knows that when you find an acoustic guitar, you have to find the right one. You know, you have to go through so many of them to find that magical one, and ours are all brilliant. So each top may be a slight different thickness? Absolutely. And we, have, we put notes on the side of each top all over on the back in pencil to determine. Uh, we also shape our tops, we graduate them. So, if this is the guitar, the headstock comes up here, and you have the bridge here. This is the bass side, the deep, low strings, and then this is the treble side, where you have the high strings and play the higher notes. We have two different ways of shaping our tops. On certain models, we graduate the top where it's thinner here, and it gets thicker here. So the treble frequencies have a good, strong, rigid board, and the treble frequency can be very small. It allows that to burst forth immediately, but the bass frequencies, you really want to move the top to push that air. And a bass frequency might be from that wall to this wall. So we shave it out where it's thinner. It's a graduated top where it gets thinner to thicker on this side. That way you get a strong treble sound, clarity, brilliance, but it's not a weak sounding guitar. On this side, you get a really softer top and you're able to push air and get a good deep sound. So when people talk about our guitars, Breed Loves, they might say, wow, this company has a really bright, precise, clean sound, it's very very high-end sound, almost shrill, and it's great for the studio or whatever. And then there's this brand, and they have really warm, bluesy sounding guitars. None are good or bad, but they have their characteristics. And when people talk about Breedlove, they, they'll say, wow, you guys are right down the middle. It's not an accurate description because we're really both. We're not we're not dead center on that, that tonal spectrum. We're both. When you play a Breedlove, it's very lively because it's, it's, it's very light woods. If you pick up any one of our guitars, the first thing you think is, Oh my God, this thing is so light. And then the second thing is you just get that brilliance, but the depth and the sound. Uh, so our original Breedlove design guitars, the, the modern ones with the, the pointy headstock and the wing to bridge, those we, we shape out that way. We also make traditional guitars similar to the way they made them in the 1930s. We do the same thing. We measure the strength of the wood and we thin it out, but we shave those tops differently. If this is the, the soundboard and you have the, the sound hole right here, the strings up here and the bridge down here. On our traditional style guitars, people call them Martin style guitars because that's kind of the quintessential old guitar, um, we shave these tops up where 
right here where the bridge is, where the strings plug in, we keep it thicker so you have that power and immediacy when you hit a chord. And, but we shave out the entire perimeter of the top so it can move the whole top and really push air. Same thing, you get a lot of high trebles, clarity, but you get this cannon boom sound. So our guitars are very rewarding that way. If you think of the way a speaker is built, you have the tweeter in the middle for the high frequencies, but you need that big woofer to just push air. So when people play three love guitars, they say a couple of things like, wow, this is so responsive and lively. It just sounds like ringing a bell. It's because of how light and thin we make the guitars. And then also, wow, I'm hearing the full spectrum of sound. So that, that makes our guitars very successful around the world. That, that's the key elements that make a breed love guitar, rather than just the design elements when people say, I like the way that looks, or I like the way that looks, or whatever. And um, we have woods that are, as I showed you, extremely rigid. So if you do it quickly, you'll just shatter the wood. We have others that are very flexible, where you can do it. It might take 12 minutes for you to bake it into a size. When you're done, after this is fully, fully bent in there, you end up with a guitar shape right here. So that's the first step in building a guitar. Then we take our wood sets over here and begin to shape out the tops in the back. Here is the uh, myrtle wood, top and back, paired. And the sides are Beautiful. down there on the stack, so very soon it'll all be joined up and glued together. The bracing gets trimmed off, I presume. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, What's the most traditional other wood that that myrtle would be similar to for sound and tone? Uh, maple. Maple? maple? Okay. Yeah. But it's a little more lively and rich than maple. Maple is very bright sounding, and that that has it's just a, a broader tonal spectrum it offers. Oregon and Israel are the only places you can find hardwood. wood. Okay, and what's the sustainability or availability for that in the future? Uh, it's it's abundant up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, and it's also I mean there are people you'll find that there are myrtle wood furniture shops and things like that. So there's a yeah a good source of it. What? Aside from myrtle wood, what are some of the other more sustainable woods that Breedlove is looking for going forward as you know some of these colas and other words disappear? Yeah, uh, coca bolo, ziracote, um, there's African blackwood, striped ebony. There's a lot of a lot of woods that the industry is moving toward. Yeah. And then uh, we still have an abundance up in Canada of this, this spruces and the maples. It's just incredible, Canada. <laughs> might be some of the most complex work that's done here, the binding. You see binding all around you, hanging out everywhere. But piece by piece, if you want to create a guitar, we have some very beautiful things here. And there are many, many steps in the binding process. So right here we have herringbone, bloodwood, and then a black, white, black strip. So as they go around and prepare the binding, it all has to be done by hand and glued together, even the little the binding between these two steps of wood, back, front, and side. So the guys all day long will be some of our most technological competitors say that they can finish a guitar case ready in 20 minutes. Oh. And it takes days, days for us to do it. We put a finish of lacquer and the, and the guitar builders will hold it up like this, spray it with the other hand, just shh, like that. Spray it on a nice even coat. And then it goes into the buffing room and gets buffed down to a very thin mirror, glass-like mirror finish. And then it goes back into the finish and we apply about five coats of this until you have a, a, a beautiful finish. When you walk through this, you're gonna see orange peel and the texture of the wood and a lot of these things like that. Um, the way we do it, uh, our, our, the finish of a breed love is so exact and the quality is so high that you might think that it's not handmade. Maybe sometimes people associate things that are uh, a little more crudely done as evidence of, of hand building. Uh, ours is all done by hand, but the quality suggests that it's automated because it's so good. And we think our, our finishes are the finest in the world, but they take an incredible amount of time and hard work and labor. And, it's, and a group of employees that are able to do it uh, and withstand you know, the, the tedium and the, the fatigue of hand doing. So we cycle through finishers all day long and, and uh, our guitar finishes are, are absolutely beautiful. So I'll take you now to the well, buffing room. Strings on it, so it sit overnight with tension, and then the following day we'll uh, do what we call the dialing process, which is actually setting the uh, the string height at the first fret, 
and taking the saddle string stamps for uh, the correct saddle height and uh, tune it up, get ready to play, clean it up, and send it out the door. There's one more inspection then after the final set of hands, the National String Up Department finish, and uh, before it goes into the case, it gets one more inspection and, and then it actually ships. It's an option that we have now. Oh, and I've never got to see that. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's called the JLD Bridge Trust. Okay, yeah.